I mean, we're sitting uh, in um, in Merthyr Tydfil in the, the wonderful building called the Red House. Merthyr Tydfil was that cauldron of activity in the 19th century. A uh, lot of riots. Uh, across the road, there's a, a pub called the Dick Penderin. Dick Penderin was a, a hero of the working class and got um, hanged in Cardiff jail for allegedly stabbing a uh, soldier. So there were lots of things happening. And I so wish sometimes that all that stuff had been recorded. But you were living in a and an era, the 60s was a, a huge cauldron of activity, lots of events happening in, in America. What was it like being a photographer during those, that period? I have to say that uh, I feel extremely lucky to have been a photojournalist from 1958 to 1972. Um, when I think back of the events of the time, and the um, uh, types of publications available to put work in, uh, you couldn't have been, you could not have been working at a better time than that. I really believe that. It, it was just pure happenstance. You know, I came of age. Um, you know, I, I studied photography uh, at Ohio University. Yes. And uh, uh, they had an interesting course there which uh, very conservative uh, instructors, uh, Clarence White, who was the nephew of uh, Minor White, yeah. was the uh, head of the department, and Walter Allen was the head instructor, basically. Um, so I went, uh, well, I went to Ohio University to study television directing, which was a brand new field. But I could not get into that curriculum in my freshman year, my first year. Uh, and but and I it, because it was in the fine arts department at that time they had no other place to put it directing or yeah. um, I had to take prerequisite course in fine arts and, to establish myself in that college uh, and so my advisor you know we all have an advisor when you first show up he says to me uh, uh, this is what I recommend uh, I recommend you take ceramics uh, one oh one. Uh, and uh, you know you just got, you go there uh, twice a week and you make ashtrays and stuff and you get uh, a you know uh, four point whatever a and then you move on you know in your sophomore year you'll be able to go into the early develop directing program so I mean I was just sitting there like ashtrays you know and then he says or you can take photography one oh one. Uh, but it's a little bit more intense because, you know, there's more work. Uh, and you're working in the dark. <laughs> so, but I had already had an interest in photography at that point. So did you I, have, do you have a camera? Did I have a camera? Yeah, at that time? Uh, no, I had borrowed cameras. I didn't have a camera of my own. So uh, I said, I'm going to do photography. So... I took Photography 101. I went to the photography department, which was housed in a building not unlike this red house, you know, an old ivy-covered brick building that had a studio upstairs that was the full size of the building, uh, sort of like a ballroom, that, but it was a studio that uh, four or five photographers could work at one time. Photographer students, I should say. We, no, we weren't photographers. And then below was uh, the labs, you know, we had developing print labs, you know, larges. Then there was a caged equipment room. Um, and so it began. So what happened is I was totally seduced by this field of photography. It had a lot to do, uh, not a lot to do with Walt Allen, mm -hmm. but it had a lot to do with the other students. My colleague students turned out to be a group of 35 millimeter geniuses. And, um, uh, and I fell in with them. And, uh, and of course, we were uh, uh, rebels because Walt Allen was a 4 by 5 view camera guy. Yes, very much in the Steiglitz style of doing stuff. Like that's what we learned on. I mean, you know, there was no getting away with it. I mean, that's, how, that's our work. Our school work was done on 8 by 10s Deer dogs, four by fives, and the best they could do for us if we went out was a speed graphic, with and it was all loading uh, holders and uh, 
But you know something? I mean, uh, it was it was a great foundation for photography. It was a wonderful foundation. So here we are, you know, with Paul Fusco, a magnum photographer, you know, who was uh, uh, two years ahead of me. Uh, Bob McElroy, who became a Newsweek uh, photographer. Uh, James Corrales, who became a look photographer and also was the assistant to Eugene Smith. Um, Bob Goodman, who became a photographer with a very famous, uh, um, her name slips my mind now, anthropologist. And he, he traveled Samoa, New Guinea, the whole thing, you know. That, was, that became his life, and he was published in National Geographic a lot. And Ben Martin, who was a time photographer. So these were the guys that were around us all the time. Uh, and we were this group of, you know, I, I guess I would have to say intellectual photographers. We, we talked about uh, issues. We didn't talk about f-stops. We talked about issues, and our cameras became tools to go out and explore these issues, you know. Uh, that was the beginning of uh, our world. There was another whole group of students there who were, uh, I would call them nerds, you know, camera nerds, you know. So they were really interested in uh, equipment and how it worked. You know, we weren't at odds with one another, but, you know, we really had very little uh, in common, except, uh, you know, we, we, we work side by side at enlarges and <clears throat> so that, that's, that was my, I came out of Ohio University, I returned to New York, I was the only New Yorker of the group, so every single one of them passed through my home, which was my parents' home, slept in our guest room until they moved on. <laughs> uh, and they all, we've all became a close-knit group of uh, ex-Ohio University people, uh, along with uh, famous artist Jim Dine, who was uh, a painter, an artist, who was part of this collection. Um, and then, I, you know, I got odd jobs, you know. But I have to tell you that when I told my parents that I wanted to be a photographer, they immediately tried to talk me out of it. <laughs> I came from a middle-class, lower middle-class Jewish home in the Bronx. My father worked through the Depression. Uh, he was lucky. He had a job that was considered uh, 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 important. And so he didn't go into the military because, you know, the, the, there were certain uh, jobs that were needed so but he lived through the depression and you know my mother too you know and and it was a terrible time and so uh they i was never a good student in the sense that you know i, I didn't do great papers uh, i didn't like to read you could see i mean i was the perfect photographer everything was visual everything and <laughs> And I didn't want to share a page with any words. <laughs> <laughs> Did they send you on, on assignments and stuff while you were, while you were studying then, uh, Chuck? Yeah, uh, but, you know, they were basic stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, go out and shoot doors, you know, uh, in the village, you know. Uh, you know, I went out with a 4x5 with a camera and I would, with a hood, and I would set it up. And I, So I decided to shoot details. So I was shooting doorknobs, which is interesting because, um, because as I developed as a photojournalist, photographing people was the key of my work, like all my friends, you know, it was a sort of the Eugene Smith, Cartier-Bresson school of photography. People who shot rocks, we used to call doorknob photographers. <laughs> And I always laugh because I said, you know, one of my key assignments at Ohio University was shooting, you know, well, it wasn't, the assignment wasn't to shoot doorknobs, yeah. it's what I decided to shoot. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yes, yeah, so I did have, we did have these sort of routine assignments, you know, that they wanted us to think yeah. about and to use the camera a certain way, shoot, shoot landscapes, you know, shoot the river, uh, you know, so everybody went out looking like uh, uh, Impressionist paintings, you know, with our... We didn't have easels, but we had sticks, yes. and we were shooting the trees and the rivers. And um, it was not no, no color, no. you know, because it was all black and white. I don't remember ever seeing color until I became a you know working photographer, really. So, as a group, were you a very politically thinking group? Yes. 
was that the driving force looking for, uh, and th- and seeking out these stories that you could um, uh, as a photojournalist was uh, uh, did you share did you work together did you go off on or was it in school in school yeah no, not too much right you know, okay. we, we looked at one another's work yeah um, Fusco and Corrales were above all the others Paul Fusco you know he's he's still a friend of mine but uh, he's he's getting on in age right now. He's like 86 or 87. Just, he was exactly like Eugene Smith, you know. Un, uncompromised photographer. You know? Yes. You know, he's a Magnum photographer who um, didn't work the way other Magnum photographers worked. And, you know, I mean, he, he was not available for all of these routine uh, um Business, what do they call it? You know, uh, commercial. Yeah, and, commercial. Uh, you know, he 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 went on his he 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 went on his own stories. He 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 put up his own money to go and shoot stories, and then come back and had Magnum sell the story if they could. I mean, he went to the Soviet Union after Chernobyl, like several years after Chernobyl, to photograph the birth defects of the kids that you know from the parents who lived there who were radiated. You know. And they were the most touching pictures of horrible freaks. You know, you can't talk about them any other, any other way. I mean, kids that had no legs and nubs for arms and and tumors growing out. I mean, they were just unbelievable. And, of course, Paul said it was the saddest time of his whole life, but he stuck it out. And, of course, they couldn't sell it. You know, he had these pictures... I mean, who would publish them? You know, so he had a he had a, a book published, and he had a, a Visa pour l'image had a uh, presentation two thousand and one that uh, my wife and I went to Perpignan to see um, and to and sort of uh, support him. Mm-hmm. You know. So when you when you returned, where well, after school and you went back home to the, yeah. to New York, what did you get up to? Oh uh, well, this is interesting because I started by saying my parents tried to talk me out of yeah. uh, being a photographer, you know. And uh, uh, their only experience with photographers were the guys who photographed weddings and bar mitzvahs. Hmm. And they were always like overweight, sweaty guys who were rude and, you know, pushed people around. And, you know, and they couldn't imagine me being, doing that. Uh, and I remember sitting at the dining table with my parents uh, and they said... Uh, why don't you uh, study to be a teacher? Because, you know, if you're a teacher, you can work anywhere. Even if there's a depression, you'll be working. And then you could be a photographer on weekends. Yeah, I can actually relate to that because the same thing happened to me, but I ended up being an actor, so work that one out. (laughs) That's even worse. (laughs) (laughs) So... uh, uh, well, you know, I, I went to Ohio University to study di- television directing, which which my parents fit the bill for. But then, of course, I came home and said, "I'm I'm being I'm a photographer." You know, uh, they were very happy when things worked out, of course. But there was a there was a time there where I lived at home. You know, I was 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. You know, uh, well, actually, I was older. You know, I came home. I was 22, 23, 24. I got married finally at 24, but. Um, but I lived at home. I never, never lived alone as a single guy. My my colleagues from college did, but they, you know, they roomed together in in New York. But I, fortunately, I had a home, you know. To um, so, what did I do? I I had to work. So uh, there was a um, a job agency in New York, uh, the Berman Agency specialized in in several fields but one of them was photography and so you'd go to the Berman agency and Mr. Berman was a, who looked like the guy who shot the wedding bar mitzvah you know, <laughs> and probably did <laughs> he uh you know he would like look at my pictures like you know and then tell me that there really wasn't any work as a photographer but he could get me a job in this place in the Bronx that did baby pictures uh so he, you know, he gave me a slip of paper to go back to the Bronx, where I was from, take a bus to this upstairs second floor place, 
And they had a business there of baby photography where several photographers went out uh, and they knocked on doors and, you know, and, and so that they were salesmen and photographers. But I didn't have to do that. Uh, they put me in the lab and they asked me if I could print. Well, because I was a really, I was a damn good printer, thanks to Ohio University, you know. So when I showed them what I could do in printing, they just said, oh, this guy can print. So, so I spent uh, about four months in the lab there printing these baby pictures with, you know, vignetted. Yeah. You, you know what they are. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And then you, <laughs> you get a card with like six yeah, pictures yeah. or five yeah. pictures on it. Yeah. The photographers would come in with their 120 rolls because they, they, they work with Roloflexes and, um, and uh, uh, I would develop their roles in Nikkor tanks and, and then, you know, so I worked de- developing and then printing and uh, I hated it, you know, but it, I got paid, uh, you know, put the lab coat on, but I could remember every day riding home on the bus. It was uh, the University Avenue bus, you know, and... Um, you know, I kept saying, this this is not what I want to do, you know. And so I started to uh, build a portfolio of street photos that I would wander around taking pictures of uh, events, if there were any, or just people. You know, put together a portfolio and started visiting magazines. I quit my job, uh, much to my parents' you know, chagrin, you know. But... Uh, you know, I started going to magazines and seeing picture editors, and uh, I got great feedback, but no work. Um, you know, because here I was, I mean, I didn't realize it at the time, but I mean, I was just a young kid photographer with 15 really nice pictures, and that's the best way I can describe them. They were really nice pictures. <laughs> uh, I'm, you know... The average person would have said they were fantastic because they couldn't do it. But photographers would look at them and say, yeah, they're pretty nice. <laughs> and that's how... So I didn't get any work. Um, then I... The first commercial work I finally got was somebody gave me the name of a small advertising agency. And uh, I know one of the names was Rosenberg, but I forgot the other guy's name. Uh, and they had a, a two-room... Second floor, 42nd Street and 6th, uh, what's called 6th Avenue. It's now Avenue in the Americas. Second floor, you know, you go up and the next door was uh, an accountant. And, you know, so these guys had this little agency and uh, they had several clients. Uh, and one of them was the Etienne Eigner handbags, which turned out later became a really major handbag company. But at that time, it was a man up in... Uh, Washington Heights making handbags in his kitchen <laughs> handmade handbags yeah. in his kitchen that was their account so I they paid me to photograph his handbags uh, which I did at home on the kitchen table with a, a short roll of uh, paper you know that yeah, I yeah. taped up to the wall yeah. and used my can light cans yeah. and photograph these things and they paid me and it was it, then they sent me out to do some other work and the actually in the field uh, there was a company they worked for that that I mean this is crazy they made the 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 floor plates for uh, fire engines okay what are they they're like silver plates that had ribbing and grids on it the firemen could run up and down onto these things without slipping and they were custom made for fire engines fitted and so they had a company out on Long Island City in New York that made these, that be, and they hired this advertising agency to put up a booklet. Like, and I, so I went out to different firehouses and, and photographed their uh, fire engine floors, and then I went to the factory, and I took pictures of the guys doing it. And All right, okay. Then I'm moving along yeah, in my yeah, career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then... Uh, this guy Byron, who went to school with us, he wasn't part of our group, but he was a photographer guy. He came, had come to New York on his own and wound up getting a job as Nina Lean's assistant at Life magazine. And so he contacted me and said that he was really fed up with New York and he was going back to Ohio, where he was from, and would I want the job? So he had set up an interview with Nina Lean. So I went to see Nina Lean, who was as dainty a 
person as you can imagine. You know, she must have weighed uh, 80 pounds, you know, and she, and she was uh, older. You know, she was one of life's original photographers, yeah. and she was a pretty damn good photographer, but now she was like in her 70s, still working for Life magazine, and the only assignment she had was to photograph art. Like that cup over there, she would photograph that cup. Painting, sculpture, jewelry, that's what she did. And what she needed was an assistant who could carry her 4x5 camera and know how to use it, and her lights, which in two big black boxes, and almost carry her. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I worked for her for a couple of months, and uh, she was very nice to me, but we really had no relationship. You know, she, you know, she, she just she called me Chuck, and she just told me what she wanted, and then she would go and sit down, and smoke a cigarette in a big long cigarette holder, and she, and you know she always wore hats. She was great, you know, um, but I worked my tush off with this, you know, and 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 she was very impressed that a young photographer knew how to open the box, pull out the uh, view camera, you know, set it up, take the um, changing cloths, load film with while talking to her in the changing cloths, you know, and she'd always say to me, are you sure you got the emulsion side up? And I'd say, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, Nina. <laughs> so I worked with her uh, as an unsophisticated kid from the Bronx, it was a great training for me to go into these homes on Park Avenue and Fifth Avenue who had artwork that was being photographed, you know, for Life magazine and museums, back rooms of museums. It was really cool. But that only lasted a few months. And then uh, then the, my big break came when, uh, well, actually, I had two breaks. One break was Charles Harbert, who just passed away recently. He was a Magnum photographer, too, for a while, and then he started his own group. I forgot what it's called, but Charlie Harbert. Uh, there was a camera store in New York called Advanced Camera on 47th Street. Advanced Camera was a clubhouse for photographers. You know, 47th, just off Fifth Avenue, if you walked into Advanced Camera, you'd always see two or three photographers in the back of the store sitting on high stools next to the counters, and just talking about their work or life uh, and looking at equipment. And uh, uh, the Fry Brothers, twins, who owned the place, was so generous to photographers that, you know, we had um, uh, charge accounts. Well, you know, giving a freelance photographer a charge account, mm -hmm. you have to have a lot of guts to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had charge accounts. Uh, we'd come in and say, I need a brick of Tri-X. It took out the you know, a package, 20 rolls, drop it down, take out his book, write it down, off we went. And I didn't have to pay him or anything, you know. I mean, because mostly we would we were working on an assignment, we'd get paid, we'd come in and pay. Uh, and, of course, I bought a lot of equipment from them, even though they were not as cheap as a peerless camera, you know, they they would sell me a Nikon for... $22 less than advanced camera, but hey, you won't let me sit in your yeah. store, you know? Yeah. So Charles Harbert was in the store one day, yeah. and, you know, curly-haired guy and uh, with a t two Leicas around his neck, and and uh, Lou Fry said to me, do you know Charles Harbert? And I said, no. He said, let me introduce you. Said, this is Chuck Rappaport. He's a young photographer here. Oh, by the way, I didn't have a charge account at this point in my life, you know, but I mean, eventually I did. So Charlie talked to me, and uh, and he said, um, "Have you been to Jubilee Magazine?" To, you know, and I said, "No." He, I don't even know. I never, I mean, never even heard of it. He said, "It's a Catholic magazine. It's the Catholic magazine, the Archdiocese of New York's magazine." He said, "Go to them." He said, "They they look for young photographers. Uh, they don't pay a lot of money." He said, "But." Uh, the quality of their printing is amazing. So your work will really stand out. So I went to see uh, the editor there, Bill. I can't remember his last name now, but it's in the blog, I think I am. Uh, so I went to see Bill, and uh, we talked. 
And, you know, he said, oh, yeah, I'd like to use you for something. Uh, give me, you know, suggest something. You know, see, I mean, I found out early on that a lot of work you had to self-generate. You know, you had to come up with ideas. Well, around this time, a friend of mine went to San Juan, Puerto Rico to work in an ad agency. I went to high school with this guy. And so he gets in touch with me and he said, you got to come down here, man. It's so beautiful. It's palm trees and, you know. And it's winter time, you know. Get down here, he said. Baseball, you know, winter baseball. So I go to Jubilee Magazine, and I said, I'm going to San Juan, Puerto Rico. And he goes, ah, I got an assignment for you. In the mountains of, of Puerto Rico, there is a missionary there, uh, and uh, we'd like you to do a story on him, a Jesuit missionary. So he said, you know, we'll give you $500. <laughs> $500, you know, this is like 1959. $500, you know, a camera was like only 300 bucks. <laughs> so off I went. I photographed, uh, you know, this, this guy. I mean, it, it's on my website, you know, the whole deal. Came back and they ran like three pages of pictures of this. So that was my first break, my first published pictures in a real magazine, you know, that that had more than 20 pages, was Jubilee Magazine. Uh, taking that, I then started looking for other work. So my big break came, and I love telling this story because it's, it's so... Uh, I'm traveling on the New York subways. They have a shuttle that goes from Grand Central to Times Square. That's all it does. So it connects two lines of the subway, the west side and the east side lines and they connect at 42nd Street. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking the shuttle across. It's very, they're always crowded. You know. So I jam into a, a subway car uh, you know, with a thousand other people, and everybody's squeezed in, and I'm holding onto this pole. And a guy next to me in a trench coat has a camera bag that seems to be getting in everybody's way. It's one of these big, uh, huge camera bags, you know, leather, square, boxed camera so I look at the guy, I look down at his camera bag, and holy mackerel, on top of the camera bag is the logo of Paris Match magazine. And I'm looking down at it, and I said, this guy is a Paris Match photographer. I wanted to work for them so badly. I got to talk to this guy. Well, I didn't have the guts to talk to him, and the door opened up, and everybody went out, and I couldn't catch him, and I didn't want to run after him. And I, and I, I, I went home to the Bronx, and my mother and... And she noticed my long face, and she said, what's the matter? And I told her what happened. And she said, well, did you ever think that maybe they have an office in New York? And I said, no, I hadn't thought about that. And she goes, well, go check the phone book. So I look up Paris Match, and sure enough, it says Paris Match, 22 East 67th Street, with a phone number. So I called them up. And to this day, I could remember my heart beating because, you know, I knew that I had only one shot. You know, I'm, I'm sure everybody's gone through this. So you're almost trembling from fear and anticipation. I call up uh, and they answered, the woman answered the phone and I said, hi, I'm a photographer that I'd like to uh, work for Paris Mag Magazine. I said, what can I do about it, you know? And she said, oh, wait, let me connect you with our photographer. So she connects me and this guy gets on, he's, he's an American, you know, Paul Slade is, he says, uh, yeah, what, what, what do you want? You know, so I said, oh, uh, my name's Chuck Rappaport. I'm a photographer. And uh, I said, say, were you on the shuttle train yesterday uh, from Times Square to, I mean, from uh, Grand Central? And he, he goes, yeah, that was me. I said, I was standing right next to you on the train. He said, I wanted to talk to you, but I was uh, kind of shy, afraid. He goes, that's, that's not a good sign. <laughs> You can't work for us if you can't talk to somebody on the subway. So I said, oh, my God, I just said the worst thing I could possibly have said. He says, do you have a portfolio? I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, can you come down today? I said, right now? He goes, yeah, right now. So I said, yeah, sure. So, you know, I hang up the phone, comb my hair, put on a sport coat and a tie, grab my portfolio, get on the subway, down to... And I go into the building up to see him. I show him my pictures. He's very congen congenial guy, you know. He just looks at my pictures and he says, you got an eye. 
and he looked at the Jubilee magazine thing, and he said, the problem I have with you is that when you work for us, for a magazine like us, we send you on an assignment. you got to come back with the pictures. There's no two ways about it, he said, you know. When I look at your pictures, I don't know what it took for you to take these pictures, you know. Obviously, you're wandering around the city and you're seeing great shots, he said. But, you know, when you're working for us, you can't wander around. you got to go and you got to get it. And you got to talk to people on the subway. You know, you, you can't be shy. So he said, so, so the answer is no. You can't work for us as a photographer. But you want to come down here and hang out with me? Come on down. Bring your cameras. Come every day. No pay. But I'll take you to lunch, he said. How's that? Deal? And I said, deal. So I came down every day, and they sent me to tasks. One of their tasks was they had a wall of bookcases that contained every publication that you can imagine, you know, every newspaper in New York, some out-of-town newspapers like the Washington Post, all Life magazines, Look magazines, Time, Newsweek, you know, U.S. News and World Report, uh, f foreign magazines, uh, and they were all stacked up on this bookcase, out of order, in a terrible, in terrible shape. He said, "I'd like you to start at the bottom and work up to the top and put every one of these publications in chronological order." So I did, and it took me like a month. You know, we got a ladder so that I could get up to the higher ones more comfortably. And I would come home, my fingers were black with newsprint, you know. I mean, it was like I was a coal miner, you know. My face, too, sometimes, because I touched my face. And then he took me out on assignments with him. Grab your cameras, we're going out. And he would give me film, and he would, like, a lot of stakeouts. We were the first paparazzis, you know. Really, the very first, and uh, there were no competition, and there was no loser. You know, I call a lot of these paparazzis losers, you know, real losers. <clears throat> we were pros, but we were doing what paparazzi do. People didn't want to agree to be photographed, and they were important to Paris Match, mostly celebrities, royalty. So we would sit outside of a, a hotel in his car, which he had a press pass for, so we could actually sit there without getting a parking ticket. And we would, he would go up to the doorman, and he would give him five bucks and tell it, you know, when Prince Charles comes out or whatever, you know, give us a high sign. And so sure enough, we'd be sitting there, and he'd go, and we would jump out, and Paul would had already told me that you go there and I'll go here, <coughs> and we would shoot from two angles whoever was walking down the street and getting into a limo and taking off. Then he would go into his car and he'd say, give me your film. And I would wind my film up and hand it to him and then he would send it to Paris and it was his take. It really pissed me off. And one day I said to him, you know, it's, I know you're giving me an opportunity here. I said, but isn't it unfair that you're putting your name on my picture? And he goes, they're not your pictures. They're my pictures. And I said, well, how do you figure that? And he goes, I'm telling you where to shoot. You're like a robot, you know. He said, I could set up a tripod with a motor. And then, you know, it's the same deal, right? And I said, no, I'm a living photographer. I'm looking through the lens. And he said, you want to quit now? You know, you can quit. So I, I said, I don't want to quit, you know. But he says, look, Chuck, you're going to get your chance. Believe me. You're going to get your chance, just like I got my chance. He said, but, you know, you got to pay your dues. And so I worked like this with them, had great lunches. Uh, all these French Paris match people, about half of them were Bulgarians anyway. But <laughs> And uh, they loved to eat lunch, and they would take me, and they, they were totally uh, amused by me. I was this naive... Jewish kid from the Bronx who didn't know so much that they could pull pranks on me. I could tell you one time they took me to a, a seafood restaurant and we all ordered uh, shrimp. 
So the shrimp came, and I'm eating the, I love the shrimp, I'm eating the shrimp, and then one of the French guys looks at me and he says, Chuck, you did not uh, divine your shrimp. I said, what? He goes, you did not divine your shrimp. I said, what are you talking about? And he picks up the shrimp and he says, you see this black line here? You have to take this off, peel it off. I said, really? He goes, this is the waste. It's the caca from the, from the shrimp. You've been eating this. And I, so I suddenly got, <laughs> I started to get sick. And then Paul says, well, what should we do? Should we take him to the hospital now? Or should we wait to see if, if the symptoms are really that bad? And I go, I'm sweating, starting to sweat. And I said, what symptoms? What? And they said, well, you know, um, just drink some more wine. <laughs> Anyway, they pulled that kind of stuff yeah, on yeah, me, and yeah. I was such a foil. They could do anything they wanted with me. Anyway, the first opportunity I had was I get a phone call from the bureau chief, uh, Stefan Gruff, and uh, I'm home, and he says, uh, he says, Chuck, uh, uh, I have an assignment for you to go to Philadelphia uh, Tomorrow, I said, what, what are you talking, what's happening? Well, Paul was supposed to do this, but uh, his wife is going crazy and he has to stay home and take her, you know, uh, away for the weekend. Uh, it's too much for, you know, he gives me the whole story. And he says, so uh, anyway, uh, there is a, um, a sporting event, uh, track meet between the USSR and the US and uh, uh, you have to go and, and take and photograph, cover it. So I said, okay. He says, so come down right away, get your credentials. So I go down and they write up uh, a, on a letterhead, a Paris match letterhead, where they have a beautiful logo, red and blue, white logo. And it says, uh, to whom it may concern, uh, Chuck Rappaport is working for Paris Match magazine. And, and I, I take... Uh, my 400 millimeter lens, you know, in this big box, and all my cameras, and my, um, a suitcase with a change of underwear and stuff, toothbrush, and I go down to Philadelphia. So, uh, so when I get down there, um, um, I go to the press office and I show them the paper, and I'm waiting for. I need a field pass, you know, I get in the infield yeah. where all the other events are, you know, pole vaulting, long jumping. They, they looking at this letter, you know, and they said, eh, "No, we're not giving you a field pass," you know. And I said, "I said, wait, wait, you got to give me a field pass," you know. I mean, I came, and they, they just didn't believe me, and I, they, told me no. So I left the office, and I said, "My God, what am I going to do? My first opportunity to work for these guys, and I can't call them up and say they won't give me a field pass," you know. So I went and bought a ticket. Uh, to get into the stadium, just like a, a spectator. So I go in, I go to my seat, and I go, this is crazy, I can't shoot the, a story from here. So I'm looking around, and then down at the bottom of the stairs is a gate that opens to what we call a bullpen, uh, which is a, really an alley between the grandstands that allows trucks and mm. to go in and out. Yeah, yeah. It's an entry into the field. So I go down there, there's a guard there, you know, uh, you know, rent the guard. Yeah. So he's standing there and I, I have all my equipment, tripod and everything. And I, I said, uh, look, I got to get inside, you know. He says, I can't let you in there. So I take out five dollars, like, just like Paul taught me. And I, I give him the five dollars and he takes it and he opens the gate and he says, if anybody asks you, I had nothing to do with this. You know, just tell them that you snuck in. I said, okay, it's a deal. So I go in, and I get up to the gate that's that separates me from the field, and I can't get past that guy. I even try to bribe him. I try to give him five dollars, and the guy does. He doesn't even look at me. It's like, so I, but he didn't challenge me from where I was. So I stayed there, and decided that was the best I could do. I was not going to get the pole vaulter who was famous, <laughs> you know, uh, and went on to win the pole vaulting in the Olympics the next year. As a matter of fact, the reason that this 
track meet was so important was that the, it was 1959 and the 1960 Olympics was coming up and we were, uh, the world was watching to see how the Russians, you know, USSR, but the Russians were going to do against the Americans. So this was a precursor. Uh, so I'm photographing. So I, I got a program when I bought the ticket and uh, start talking to another guy who's, you know, I mean, there are, there are a few people standing around me. So there's another guy there who is a, is a track and field, uh, you know, like an expert. So we're looking at the program and he's telling me, this guy is really, this, this is the guy to watch for the 10,000 meter. He's going to, you know, he's going to win the Olympics. He's, gonna, he's the greatest, you know. So I said, okay, I'm going to, so I, I identify him. So when the 10,000 meter race starts, they run right past me every lap. And I start photographing him. Well, all of a sudden, on the final lap, he collapses from heat, you know, heat exhaustion, right in front of me, like 15 feet, right in front of me. And uh, so I, I photographed this guy stumbling, turning, twisting, falling down, getting up, trying to, trying to finish, can't, and then passing out. So th then I go home, and Monday morning I get a call from Paul, and the first thing he says to me is, did you get a, pic you get a picture of this guy c collapsing? And I said, yeah, I got a whole sequence. He goes, great, bring it in. So I brought it in. We process it in New York because we had we because uh, Perry match closed on Thursday, so we had time, and we look at the pictures. We send it to Paris, and then the teletype comes in on Thursday, uh, and it says uh, in French, but it said uh, USA USSR track meet. Um, a runner collapsing on track, two pages. Who is Rappaport? Qui, say, qui est Rappaport? Wow. Who, who is Rappaport? And I didn't get the telex because I was, you know, it had come in when I was sitting across the room. One of the guys pulled it out and they, and they said, Chuck, Chuck, you should know. You have two pages in this week's magazine. Congratulations. And everybody... Of course, it was Perry Match. They opened the bottle of champagne, and everybody drank, and that was and that was the beginning. And then, then I started working, Fidel Castro, uh, you know, uh, uh, Francois Truffaut. I mean, I started shooting for them. I became a regular freelance photographer, and 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 I, you know, I worked side by side with Paul as a, you know, he he. I became his first guy to go to whenever. He couldn't do it, you know, or he needed a second. And what was his reaction to you when all that sort of, when you became part of the, you know, you became the photographer? His reaction to me was, uh, well, you know, he was proud that, that he sort of nurtured me. And then, uh, I, and then I think he got a little bit uh, concerned about, just like any one of us would, you know, uh, helping out of somebody to become a photographer and then seeing them really become pretty good. And then you say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I really was no threat to him for a number of reasons, you know. And the number one reason was he was so much more professional than I was. I mean, he knew how to do all this by, uh, by instinct, you know, uh, and, and by uh, uh, just years of experience. And I was just learning. So I could take really good pictures, but there were some that I missed because I just, you know, I, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know to get there. I mean, I learned a lot from working for them. Yeah. But, um, you know, but I, I became a successful photojournalist who knew how to, uh, you know, take take a story and, and shoot it. Yeah. So uh, um, in, in terms of, uh, so Paris Match, Into Life, magazine uh, I mean I remember buying the book the best of life yeah in 1973 I bought the book I was in college and I bought the book because and I was because I was in sort of um, enthralled by photography I had a camera and 
Um, but uh, and but that sort of work really um, blew me away. I think mm -hmm. because of the standard of the photography, and uh, it was something um, uh, I guess that I'd never seen before. Um, I had the same experience with the book um, um, that was put out by the Metropo by the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, uh, oh God, the title just slipped out of my mind. You know, that's what happens when you get to be seventy nine years old. You know, there's just too much information up here. But the, there was a book that was the greatest pictures of of all time. You know, from everywhere, and it was just one page after another of amazing photos, you know. Um, so what happened with Life Magazine is, uh, well, a couple of things. First, there, there was an editor at Life Magazine whose, whose principal job was to uh, look at all the submissions from amateurs and photographers from around the world and see if there's anything worth publishing. In the back of the magazine called Miscellany, there was one page, the very last page of Life Magazine every week and miscellany was a photo of you know of some dog you know uh, climbing a tree or you know I mean <laughs> yeah it's a weird stuff weird stuff that was yeah. taken by amateurs but they were you know they they were really fun a lot yeah, of them yeah. so it was her job to field this she, she saw a lot of bad pictures you know her other job was to talk to young photographers who came in and wanted to work for Life magazine and I was one of them and she took a liking to me and my work. She kept talking to the picture editor to, to see me, and they, they wouldn't, they just wouldn't, they didn't have the time. They had enough freelance, young, we would, they called them young lions. The young lions, they were you know, photographers in their 20s who were willing to, you know, jump in front of buses to get pictures for them, and, and they were good. So they didn't need another one. Uh, well, you know what she did for me? That she would give me film, free film from life, and process it if I would go out and shoot news stories in, in the city to try to break in by, you know, I, I, would, I would give her the film, she would look at the stuff, and she'd give it to the picture editor, because that was her job, to look at stuff and hopefully get published. Not, it, didn't, it, wasn't, it didn't happen, you know, but I didn't do too many of them, you know, so it wasn't like I was doing it every day. Then one day I was in her office and she said, uh, have you ever talked to Buddy Bloodgood at Sports Illustrated? And I said, no. And he, she goes, well, wait a minute. So she picks up the phone and she calls him up and she says, I've got a young photographer here and I think you should talk to him. Send him down. So I went down to his floor in the Time Life building, and he looks at my work, and uh, he says, uh, I could tell you're not a sports photographer. And I said, well, I said, uh, you know, you really haven't given me a chance. And he said, no, it's not a, it's not a question of, of a chance, he said. If you were a sports photographer, you would have sports photography in your portfolio, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and I said, well, yeah, you know. He said, okay, let me ask you a question. What's your favorite team? I said, oh, the New York Yankees. You know, I grew up in the shadow of Yankee Stadium. So he said, when, when's the last baseball game, a Yankee game you went to? Honestly, he said, tell me. I said, I went with my dad, like, for his birthday, playoff game for his birthday. I said, you know, uh, I think it was like three years ago. So he said, so you... You went to your favorite team is the Yankees, and you, three years ago you went to a, to see a game. I said, "Yeah, you're not a sports photographer." <laughs> he said, "Let me tell you, the guys who work for me at, at Sports Illustrated, they're great photographers, but beyond that, they love sports. They eat sports. They love it. They know all about sports. That's why they get these great pictures because they understand what's going on." So. I closed my portfolio, and he said, however, you take damn good pictures of people, and I have a need for that. Some of my sport photographers can't shoot people. They can't, if the person's not moving, they don't see them. So he said, so give me your number, and you know, your uh, 
information and we'll see what we can do. So uh, it wasn't very long after that meeting that he calls me up and it tells me he wants me to go and shoot a marble tournament in uh, New Jersey where these nine year, 10 year old kids are, are playing marbles. But it's the national champions and they're pretty damn good, these kids. And so I, I'm shooting these kids, you know, with their tongues out, you know, concentrating on, and I get two pages in Sports Illustrated. Wow. And, you know, and they send me to the spo- Soapbox Derby, which is, you know, these yeah, home, yeah. You know, homemade yeah, yeah, yeah. cars. Yeah. <laughs> he said, um, and it was the trials, not the big one, you know. In other words, it was the East Coast trials or Northeast trials. He said, I'm not interested in the races, he said. We're going to cover the, the national champions. He said, what I wanted you to shoot is the interaction between the boys and their dads. He said, you know what I'm talking about. The dad who's like yelling at his kid. and So that's what I did, you know. Using my 180 millimeter lens, I'm really getting in close on this. and So that was a success too. And then... Uh, then I get drafted into the army, you know, because of the Berlin Wall, 1961, and I tell everybody that I'm working for Parry Match, and, you know, Sports Illustrated, that I will no longer be available for two years if I actually am inducted, you know, if I pass the physical and everything, because that was still iffy. But, uh, and so I leave it at that. Then I get a call from Buddy Bloodgood, and he says. Uh, he said, Chuck, are you still in the, are you in the Army yet? And I said, no, no, I'm not going until next week. Oh, good. He said, I have an assignment for you. He said, there's this crazy guy in Manhattan who has this gymnasium of some sort that has this equipment, uh, torture-like equipment, and he's stretching people and bending people. And he said, one of our freelance writers wrote a piece about him. Uh, he's an old guy, and uh, uh, he's kind of he's wild. He said, uh, the title of the article is, be like an animal. He said, so I want you to go there and photograph this guy and like, you know, just think of that, that line. So I go up there and photograph Joseph Pilates, the guy who had created the Pilates thing, method. And uh, I turn my film in and I go in the army and I completely forget about that assignment. I didn't even know that they ran the pictures because, you know, when they finally ran the pictures, I was deep into basic training, you know, crawling through under barbed wire. Um, and so uh, it wasn't until years later that uh, I realized that I had these pictures of Joseph Pilates, and I realized I had the only pictures of this guy in his studio of the quality work that I shoot. And I'm not saying that he wasn't photographed, but he was snapshotted by people, you know, but I took real pictures so of it. So did you own the, the copyright to those photographs? Then? Uh, if you're in this, I don't know how it is here, but uh, in the States, if you're freelance, you own the work. If you worked on a staff... Yeah, it's exactly the same here. Then yeah. the publication yeah. had the copyright. Yeah, yeah. So I, own, I never worked on staff, and I so I owned all the pictures. Although Sports Illustrated put up a big fight. They didn't want to give me negatives back. Uh, but I finally convinced them that that uh, I owned the negatives, and they, gave me and you know that one day assignment became the most lucrative of all assignments of my career because I'm selling those pictures of Joseph Pilates. Yesterday, I sold nine hundred dollars worth of those pictures on my website. You know, what was your what's your approach to photographing people? Because uh, I. Th- I um uh, one of the life photographers, and I forget his name, um, he said you have to click with a person before you click the shutter. Absolutely, he's right. I don't know who it was, but he's, you know... Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a natural. What can I say? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I know. Seriously, yes. I mean, I, I have to be honest about myself. I'm, I'm not. It's not a question of patting myself on the back. I know that I'm... Uh, my naivete, which sort of follows me wherever I go, even though I've become pretty sophisticated, there's a certain element. I'm interested in everybody. I'm interested in what they do and how they think. And so uh, if you have that attitude, if you come into a room and say, I'm a life photographer, and so you better kiss my ass, uh, you know, things are not going to click. 
But if you come in and say, what do you do? I, so interesting what you do. You're such an interesting person. You, you know, you're great. You're wonderful. And I'm here to, to, to document this. They fall in love with you. And I try to tell this to all photographers, you know, if when I have the opportunity, I always say, you know, there are a couple of rules in, in photography that I follow. One is you have to know what kind of picture you want before you go to take it. Yeah. Don't count on the picture showing up. You know, you, you have to know the, what kind of picture and you got to know where it's going to be and how you're going to, you know, where you're going to be, you know. That's so important. I mean, I've scooped other photographers many times when I was working because I decided to be somewhere the way they weren't. They would rather stand in a group. I went and looked at other places. And the other thing was, you have to connect with these people. If you're working with people, you have to connect with them and you've got to become part of their world and so that they like you. If they don't like you, then they don't want a camera in their face. Yeah. That's it. Did, was it a, a philosophy um, that came to you, or was it a philosophy that you that um, uh, that uh, of somebody you admired? Was it was did? No, yeah, I understand what you're asking, but I I think it's something that that uh, just uh, is part of me. Yes, I'm just even without a camera. Yes. I mean, you know, I'm not always with a camera and I'm not always taking pictures, but I'm always interested in what's going on around me. Yes. You know, I, uh, I've spent my life uh, witnessing things that happen. And uh, uh, even though somebody, people may call me self-involved or self-interested, which, which, and they'd be right, because in a lot of ways I am, but I'm, more, I'm just as involved in what the world is doing and, and which is why I became a photographer, which is why I was attracted to photography, is because I just didn't want to take beautiful pictures. I wanted to take pictures of what was happening in the world uh, and, and record it forever. Do, do you think the power of photography has changed since those, you know, those heady days of the 60s, early 70s? Uh, things have changed remarkably since then with the advent of digital, etc. Do you think that um, people's approach to photography has changed or are photojournalists different animals to what you were in the 60s? I don't think they're different. I just attended uh, Visa pour l'image mm. because my, they screened my Aberfan pictures this year. Mm. That was just two weeks ago. And so I saw a lot of work there. Of the, of the These are all current working photojournalists, young people, middle-aged, you know. Uh, I'm amazed at the work they do. You know, really, they're just fabulous. And so I don't think it's changed. I think they have the same need to take the pictures, to get, to, you know, to witness. To, and to tell a story. To tell a story, and they have, uh, and they're clicking with people, you know, otherwise they wouldn't be getting those pictures, you know. Mm -hmm. And and, the, and these, were the, these were the cream of the crop. These were the, you know, today's best. Yeah. So, and the, re you know, see, so, I mean, one could say, well, do you really need to click with people, you know, to do it? And I would say, well, you know, if you want to be at the top, you know, those, those are good people that, they're all, every photojournalist that I've ever met who, you know, was worth, you know, worth their weight in pictures and film was, um, was somebody I liked hanging out with. You know, they're all... Yeah, and it was the same with the with the writing journalists as well, because that 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 um, uh, cooperation between a photographer and actually the actual journalist yeah. writing journalist is quite important. You know, I I enjoy working with journalists and right. picking their brains and knowing how they think about absolutely. It. And there's there's just something that uh, because they spend their life outside of themselves, mm. they have a certain uh, camaraderie with other people who do the same. Yeah. I have a question I want to ask. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, what was the gig you did after Abervan? Do you remember the gig you did, the, the shoot, the assignment you did after Abervan? <laughs> it's interesting. I, I really don't. Uh, let's see, 66, 67, 66? No. Abervan was the number one story of my whole career. Yes. I didn't know it at the time, but... I never spent uh, uh, 
five or six weeks on any other story, you know, that length of time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I contributed to the bankruptcy of Life magazine, I think, you know. Because <laughs> they owed me a lot of money when I got home. Because they, they were paying me $150 a day in 1966, plus expenses. So, you know, it was, I was an expensive story. Yeah. Uh, but I proved to them, you know, that I was, I was valuable in that. But, you know, I started to get tired of it. You know that I had a second career. Yes, uh, indeed, yes, right. Uh, so, uh, you know, magazines were folding. Yeah. And um, when Life magazine folded, they, the, one of the editors there who was close to me said, it's okay, we have a magazine called People. You, get, you know, mm. you can go to work for them. And I looked through the magazine, mm. and I said, I don't want to work for this magazine. You know, this... They didn't have one photo essay in the whole magazine. Everything was a single solo shot. You know, you were lucky to get a spread of two pages. Yeah. And who were the uh, who was the people that you were shooting? You know, the 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 equivalent of the Kardashians of the day. You know, yeah. I, so I, that was the end. So I wrote a, a screenplay yeah. and sold it, and that was. A, but it's it's pictures again, isn't it? it absolutely. It's it's seeing pictures in your head which you had to do as a photographer. You had to see pictures in your head. I don't know how many people realize that really good photographers see the picture before they shoot it. You Indeed, know? yeah. And, uh, did you just, uh, was it uh, the transition uh, abrupt or was it, um, or did you think, well, I'll try this out and see how it goes? And Yeah. I, had, uh, I wanted to direct, uh, make a movie. Right. And, and so I knew that I just couldn't walk up to somebody and say, I want to direct. Yeah. So I wanted. So I wrote a script, and uh, I thought that would be my leverage. You know, I'd say this is a script, and they'd say, "Ooh, we love this script," and I would say, "Yeah, but uh, I have to direct it." Well, that didn't happen, but that's what well, that was my plan. Yeah. So they bought the script, but they didn't want me to direct it. So, right. Were you disappointed? Yeah, yeah. I. Uh, you know, you know, my wife has a saying about me. She says, you know, Chuck, you made all your dreams happen. She, she really, that's one of the things that she admires about me is that I always had a dream about something and then I would pursue it and make it happen. So it was photography. It was working for Paris Match. It was working for Life magazine. Then it was writing. I did direct film eventually, you know. You know, the story of my career as a writer was is, is another interesting story you know that I made happen I wrote the script um, this is before it was sold I wrote a script and uh, uh, a friend of mine at Life magazine Tommy Thompson was the uh, head of the uh, entertainment uh, division and uh, the the uh, graduate had just come out the movie the graduate with Dustin Hoffman and I said to him boy does this guy Dustin Hoffman would be perfect for my script I said, uh, you just did a story on him. I said, could you give me his phone number? And he goes, oh, Chuck. He said, I, he said I'll give you the phone number, but you can't, you can never let him know that, you know, we, we did this. Okay, so he, I got his phone number. I called Dustin Hoffman up. He answered the phone. And I said, Dustin Hoffman, my name's Chuck Rappaport, and I wrote a screenplay that I think you'd be perfect for. He goes, how did you get my number? So I said, well, I, I, actually, I got it off the desk of somebody that when they went out of the room, I saw it. So I said, but that's not important. I said, the thing is that you should read my script and, and, you, should, <laughs> and, you, should, and you should act in it. So he said, well, I live on 12th Street, he said, and I'll give you the number and you can come into the building and leave the script at my door. So I said, okay. So I did. So I left the script there. Then... Uh, coincidentally, I have a friend in New York who has a friend who is a producer. So he has a breakfast, invites me and my wife, and he and his wife to breakfast so that I would meet them. So I, I meet this guy, John Maxton Graham was his name. And uh, so we're talking, and I told him I have a script, and, and he said, oh, I, I would love to read your script. And I said, okay, I didn't bring it, you know, but I said, oh, I'll, I'll bring it to your office. And he said, fine. So... Uh, so I leave him. So, you know, I feel good. I now made a contact with a producer who was interested in reading my script. Then I go home, and I'm sitting in my living room with my wife. The phone rings. I'm, I'm going to say, hello. He said, is this Chuck Rappaport? Yeah. 
Hi, this is uh, Dustin Hoffman. I said, it's Dustin Hoffman. Ah, yes, hi. He goes, I just read your script. He said, I love your script. It's great. He said, you know, I love that scene with the shotgun and you know, over the door and how you see it in the screenplay and how, and how she goes to, you know, and he's talking, to, you know, he's, he's telling me that he's read the script. So he, I said, this is great. I said, so do you want to do it? And he goes, well, he says, it's more complicated than that. He said, but the, the, the simple answer is yes, but the complicated answer is that I want to give it to a director, a friend of mine. And I said, oh, well, I'm going to direct it. And he goes, oh, oh, I didn't know that. He said, what have you directed? I said, nothing. <laughs> he said, do you, mind, do you mind if I show it to Ulu Grossbart? director he's a, he's a Broadway director that wants to get into film he said and, and we've often talked about finding a script that we could do together this may be it so I said well you can give it to him I said but um, I don't know if I'm going to let it go like that he said he said okay that's a, that's fair so then I go to see John Maxton Graham right like a day later you know give him the screenplay and they're holding the screenplay in their hands, he and his partner, and we're talking, and he says, uh, first question we have always is, have you shown this to anybody else? And I said, yeah, I showed it to Dustin Hoffman, who just called me like yesterday and told me he wanted to do it. <laughs> well, the proverbial crap hits the fan, you know, as they say. Uh, and I said, and he wanted to show it to another guy named... Uh, Ubu or uh, and he goes Ulu Grossbart yeah. Do you have an agent? And I said no. He said hang on a second. He calls up and he goes Bob, I have a writer here that needs an agent. He said you'd be perfect for him. Okay. He said William Morris right up the oh, street. Cool. He said right. go yeah. see Bob Brand. Right. And he, and we'll read the script. I said okay. So I go up to see Bob Brand and I. I, I never forget this. I go in the waiting room, and it happens to also be uh, a day when they're seeing beautiful models or something. You know, so I'm sitting in this waiting room uh, to see Bob Brand, who I don't know, and it's William Morris, and and all around me are these incredibly beautiful like women. You know, it's like I said, this is the life that I'm looking for, <laughs> right? <laughs> Then I go to see Bob Brand, and he, he talks to me, and I said, uh, well, here's the situation. Um, I'm leaving in a little while to go live in the south of France, which is true. Uh, so, um, uh, but if this whole thing with uh, Dustin Hoffman works out, I said, you know, I could come back. And he goes, great. He said, okay. He said, uh, here are the papers to sign. I said, whoa, you got I have to sign papers? He goes, yeah. He said, if you're going to be represented by us, you have to sign papers. I said, I got to talk to my wife. So I called Mary up, and, uh, and she says, great, you know, let's do it. So I, so I signed the papers, and then off I go to France, and the whole Dustin Hoffman thing <laughs> falls apart. John Maxton Graham won't pay my agent, who he sent me to, a, uh, you know, a, a fee to hold the screenplay, and it falls apart. And so I'm in the south of France when I when uh, living in a really rural, rural area on a vineyard that a friend of ours bought. And uh, uh, the local postman comes on his motor, moped, you know, and he rides up and he salutes me and says that he had a telegram for me. And I open it up and it's from Bob Brand. It says, uh, just sold your script to Palomar Pictures, $15,000. He said... Uh, you know, do you want me to wire you any money? And that was it. Beginning, they never made that movie, Palomar, but Palomar gave me uh, an assignment to write another movie, which was made, and my career started, and then I became a TV writer, and the rest is history, you know. <laughs>